Case Stout is a partner in Pollard, Thomas and Edwards, one of London's leading housing architects with projects ranging from five homes to 5,000. The practice retains the full range of skills in-house to take projects from inception to occupation in the belief that an architect cannot create a successful concept without understanding how it will be delivered. So Kay, like many in the industry, you must have been shocked by the picture of the construction industry, which emerged from the Grenfell inquiry. What do you think architects and built environment professionals more generally need to do to make sure these things don't happen in the future? We all have to be really clear across um, the project as to what it is that we, we are being asked to do for each of our roles what we're being asked to be responsible for and, and ensure that with across the whole team that there aren't there aren't any gaps. We also need to be clearer about the client's priorities and what they are and actually what is driving their procurement. Is it just the lower the lowest cost or is it something else? And I think everybody really needs to be open and honest really about their roles and about what they're trying to achieve. Many of the housing projects that, that we work on in this office um, really do come down to needing to be very mindful of the costs and that is our specialism and I think that's something that we do well and I think we also enjoy that challenge. But what's interesting is that most of those projects um, have ended up becoming a single stage design and build um, as the form of procurement. I qualified in the early 90s and even back then um, the Latham report, subsequent Egan report and then more recently the Farmer report have all identified problems with single stage design and build um, and what the, the problems that they have resulted in and I think probably most importantly the, the lack of collaboration. So understanding roles and really trying to find a, a solution as to how we can all work more collaboratively has, has really got to be some kind of general points that, that come out of all of this. I know that the Housing Forum is looking at this and particular, particularly looking at procurement and I think that they're coming up with the the same um, conclusion that actually the methods of procurement need to be reviewed. If we're going to work collaboratively across the whole um, building industry, we really do need to understand what each other's motivations are um, and be open and honest about it and, it and exposing those where, where they're not aligning with whatever it is that, we, that we're all being asked to do. Finally, I think we've got to be really mindful of the small, of the small print. This, goes down to looking at the small print of the building regulations, but probably more importantly, uh, like test data for materials, products and information that we get from manufacturers. Manufacturers uh, products are very good at telling us all the things that, that materials can do, but they're perhaps not quite so honest and open about what they can't do. And I think that this has led to confusion um, across a, a, a range of products. And I think we really need to get much more clarity but until we get that clarity we just really do need to be mindful of the small print. So what do you think of the changes which are proposed uh, in the uh, building safety bill because that that would give uh, greater responsibilities to members of the uh, building team won't it? The uh, Hackett report has shown that it's been really difficult to pin any responsibility down on anybody and it's all been across the across the, the building environment you know the, the responsibility and accountability has been passed from pillar to post um, so I think that it makes complete sense that you that one might look at the entities of the designer and the builder and say well the person who or the entity that designs the, the building should take some form of responsibility and the entity that builds the building should take the other the other form but I think as, a, as I've just um, pointed out previously there's an army of specialists designers and subcontractors um, who are involved in all of this and so I'm not quite clear how um, these this accountability and responsibility will be will be implemented and I think it'll be interesting to see how that works I think that the the bill is really relying on a, a sea change in culture from one which at the moment I think can be quite adversarial and it, it's really relying on us knowing more about what each each other is doing. I've often thought that 
the construction industry really needs some sort of marriage guidance um, and perhaps this bill is a real opportunity for the, for the for the for the industry to sort of look at itself and have a bit of counseling to see how we can we can work better together there's also a requirement for some upskilling of of all of us finally i think that the the process really implies that there's a kind of clean sign off of materials and design uh, probably by the architect prior to starting on site um, and I think at the moment that's just not how um, the building industry works and it's not the way that um, contracts are procured. No, the relation, relationship between the architect and the contractor in the design and build contract um, is such that you know the architect is really just effectively another subcontractor we're answerable to the main contractor and it's sometimes it's possible that we that we do feel that we that we can be quite marginalized so you know if you're asking the the architect in the bill to take responsibility for for what has been agreed between the designers and the whole team and and the contractor prior to starting on site then there's got to be a sort of level of openness and honesty there and and what that means to me is that the the relationship of the design and build um, contract needs to be overhauled and we need to find a new way of, of working and a new way of doing things. Um, and I just wanted to say one thing really, which is that I think the point about the bill, as I said, is about trying to, to find accountability. And I think, in, and that's not just accountability of architects and contractors, that's also accountability of, of clients who are developing um, tall housing projects. And I wonder if what this what the bill may do is result in fewer clients wanting to take on the risk of developing tall housing complicated tall um, housing projects and everything that that in, entails and possibly might that mean that there are fewer architects who want to take on that risk and possibly there might be few contractors who want to do that and so given that there is a, a shortage of housing is it possible that 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 could make things worse I mean one way of, of reducing that risk is really by again looking at the farmer report limiting the element of risk and sort of you know looking at the off-site uh, possibilities that you can get from that where the components are known tested elements uh, and actually that rather than trying to come up with a unique bespoke architecturally designed solution for every project that actually you have a kind of set of known tested high quality solutions that that will deliver what you're asking of it. So do, do you think that the three stages and the, the golden thread which came out of the Hackett report is the, the right way to go or, or do you think maybe a, would you prefer a return to a more traditional contract where the architect retains greater responsibility through the project or do you think architects aren't really up to taking on the risk that that entails? There are so many participants in involved in, in housing construction now and the architect is in a unique position. Um, we are responsible for conceiving the, the idea and, and the design. Uh, and then, you know, sort of like a, a conductor of the orchestra, we're there coordinating um, all the different, different players. And I think the point about the golden thread is to encourage and require the architects and its orchestra to be thinking about safety and buildability um, from the beginning and recording it and and keeping that at the forefront of their minds throughout um, the whole process. And so I think that's a really positive thing. Um, and I do think it's going to involve significant re-education um, within, the, within the profession. I qualified in the early 90s and um, I was probably one of the sort of last stages of, of using traditional contracts but I think that the you know the skills that, that were required then relative to the to the um, the knowledge that you need now are, 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 re are really quite different you know I mean people can get get master qualifications and degrees in fire engineering you know that's 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 a very different level of expertise relative to understanding the the, the building regulations part B and so I, I think I think that there is an improvement um, in an upskilling certainly required um, from the profession but I, I don't think that we should be shying away from it I think we should be 
offering to participate and contribute as, as best we can. The Architects Registration Board is going to have power to monitor the competence of architects on its register. And as you say, there are lots of specialisms that go into the whole, whole process. Uh, what uh, should practices be doing to respond to the whole aspect of competence and what are the areas they need to do better in? Through most of my career now, there's, there's been a sort of idea that we can probably all do a little bit of everything, um, that, we, that we can be general practitioners, that we can design homes and we can put our, put our mind to an office building or a hotel or, or you know, a, whole, a whole range of, of different types of projects. I think probably what this is going to, what's going to come out of this is that we do have to raise our standards and we do have to raise our levels of skill and competence. But I think we're going to have to focus on the sectors that are, the, are, are our specialisms. So, you know, Paula Thomas Edwards specialise in housing. And I think we like to think that we are actual specialists in housing and we need to keep honing and re-honing our, our skills at doing that. So, uh, so I'm wondering if the days of saying, well, we could do a bit of this and a bit of that are, are diminishing and actually we all need to become more specialists and less, and less general. Um, and I think we need to not pretend to ourselves that we can probably try our hand at everything because I, I actually don't think that that's going to be um, realistic. At the same time, I think it's putting training at the forefront and and absolutely um, making CPD the the the, the central element uh, to what we're doing is is really key. I mean, we are quite a big practice, and we and we invest a lot of our. Um, money in BIM specialists and sustainability specialists and document managers and and there's a, a whole area of sort of research that we that we have invested our money in. I wonder how many practices will be able to afford to do that um, and therefore I think I wonder if there will be a, sh a shift in the way that that people work that, that you specialize you invest you um, you really kind of look at the, the minutiae of, of that particular aspect or you do something else but you're not expected to do that across the whole board of, of the built environment. So what do you think we could be doing at NLA to help support the profession in, in enhancing competence? The NLA is in a really great job actually of promoting architecture and planning and, um, and development and the new london quarterly it's great it's like the vogue magazine of construction it's fantastic but i think that there's been a real tendency to focus on concept and planning and the finished the finished article and there's probably been less um focus on actually the components of of how those finished developments are are completed i think that the fact that the Pharma report identified that not many young people or, or women are particularly attracted into the industry is is probably true and I think that actually the NLA has a real opportunity to to try and kind of address that I think that um, the the sort of promotional qualities of of the NLA are are great and therefore to, to sort of make more of an emphasis on the construction aspects would be a really good opportunity um, so actually to look at and, under, and have a better understanding of how those components go together would be a really great um, opportunity. I also remember um, I attended a, a seminar at the NLA a few years ago which actually was looking at why young people are not interested in signing up to the construction industry and um, it felt at the time as if it was probably more of a sort of oh no 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 really it's actually all okay that you know there's lots of developers in the room and we have a lot of um, young people that are in the room who have been trained up by us and actually aren't we really doing a, a, a great job and I think the the NLA has a real opportunity to shine a light to shine more of a light on that and rather than to gloss over it and to say actually perhaps you're not doing such a great job and, and why is that and to, and to drill down and into that a little bit more more carefully um, because I think skills and and skill shortage are really going to have an impact on on all of this um, you know if there aren't enough if there aren't enough 
architects, if there aren't enough surveyors, if there aren't enough builders, if there aren't enough specialists uh, with pride in what they do, then it then it, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And so I think you have a real um, a real opportunity to to kind of help promote that one way or another. Thank you very much. We'll uh, uh, take you up on those observations. So, Kay, uh, thank you very much for answering my questions and thank you very much for uh, giving us your insights. Thank you very much for asking me. It was, it was a very interesting experience. Thank you. <laughs>